so up to this point, when we've looked at differences between groups, what has been our approach for trying to evaluate if there are differences? I know you know answers because I saw your, your take home cards. Sure, we're going to use means and proportions, right? In that case, though, we are talking about a continuous outcome, right? If we're testing for a difference, for example, between like height between two groups or rate of success between two groups or something like that, we are still measuring a continuous outcome, right? Where it can take on, uh, can, for proportions, it can take on any number between 0 and 1. Um, for other measures, for height or things like that, it can take on a whole host of measures. We're shifting now to where, in, in the first case, we had a group, we would have two groups, and then a continuous measure within each group, right? Where we're comparing proportions between the groups or um, heights between the groups. In either case, we were separating the groups, and then we were, had a continuous measure within each one. Well, what we're going to look at now is we're still going to say, okay, people between groups, but instead of looking at a continuous outcome, we're going to say, okay, now within each group, we are going to have maybe some successes and some failures. And so we're going to ask questions about, um, this allows us to say, okay, let's look at males and females, and let's look at those who received the treatment and those who received the placebo. And we're going to ask, okay, is the effectiveness of the treatment dependent or related to gender? We can start asking these questions um, in ways that we could not before. Okay, so that's kind of the motivation behind these ideas. So one thing we could look at, and I'll let you take a look at this for a second just to read through it. Okay, so this is a very common data summary that we're going to see going forward. We have, and so when I think about this part of the table, I like to phrase it as thinking about whether the event occurred. Okay, did the event occur or did it not occur? So yes or no, okay? It's, and that's going to be a way to break down these tables over and over again is you're going to have, okay, in one case, I have the treatment, right, aspirin or placebo. Here I have whether the particular event I'm interested in occurred or if it did not. So in each of these cells, what does the 10,933 represent? Okay. Right, so the number of people who were taking aspirin and did not have the event occur. Okay. Um, what do you notice in terms of had the event versus did not have the event? Yeah, right, a lot more people did not have the event occur than did. And this is pretty common. We'll see a lot of situations where we're interested in events that are relatively rare. Um, and this question about how rare is going to be important as we start looking at relative risk and odds ratios. Um, we care about a couple of probabilities. I'd like you to think to yourself for a minute, if we're looking at the probability of our event, given the treatment with aspirin, how would you calculate that? Okay, right, so we have 104, which is the number of events that actually occurred, and we're only looking in this case at this top row, right? Because we are asking the probability that the event happened given that the treatment was, the treatment was with aspirin. Okay, so that, we're saying 
the first part is saying given, so that means we're only going to look at the top row for this. And within this top row, the probability of the event occurring is 104 divided by 11,037. Everybody okay with that piece? So similarly with the placebo, we're going to say, okay, given that they had the placebo, which means we're going to look at this row, the probability of the event occurring is the number of yeses over the total number of people that took the placebo. So we're interested in those two probabilities. So we want to know, because when we generate those two probabilities, the probability of the event occurring uh, given that you had the treatment and the probability of the event occurring given that you had the placebo or control, we want to do some things with those probabilities. If we were trying to evaluate the effectiveness of aspirin, we would want to be able to go through some process to say, okay, clearly aspirin reduces the probability or the risk of this event as compared to the placebo. Right? That's a normal thing we would ask. And this doesn't always mean that we have to, that it's going to be a placebo. Um, it could also just be current standard of care versus new treatment instead of placebo. But typically, when you look at these um, tables, it's not abstracting some qualities of the table, <clears throat> we're going to have up here whether the event occurred, and here we're going to have did they receive the treatment or did they receive the control. Okay, and we'll, I'll, So when I refer to control, that means they had the placebo or they had the current standard of care. Um, they just did not have the treatment itself. So, if you actually go through and calculate these probabilities, why, are, why do I have hats on top of P1 and P2? They're estimates, right? They are, think, we are trying to use these values to generalize to a larger population. So we consider the people in this study to be our sample, and we're trying to use these people in the sample to make conclusions about a broader population. Um, okay, so if we say taking aspirin reduced the risk of disease by 0 0.0077 compared to taking a placebo, we looked at a situation a couple of weeks ago where we determined that it was pretty confusing to look at decimals. It's really difficult for us to quantify how the size of decimals, for example. Like, it's really easy for us to compare things like four to two. It's much more difficult, at least typically, to look at this and be able to compare two numbers like this. So, what we often want to do is try to translate it and make it easier on ourselves to do comparison. Because what this really means is this number here is about 3.3 eh, 3 .3 times as large as this number here. But that's pretty difficult to see until you actually like move things out here and move the decimal place. So that's one reason that when we talk about things like relative risk instead of absolute risk, we're doing so because we end up comparing these using a proportion. So it's much easier to say, okay, so if I took a difference here, and I took 0 0.0010 minus here, right? This is, the difference is going to be small. Okay? This does not help me very much. Right? This is very difficult to interpret. But if I took this instead, I created a ratio of these two numbers, which is going to be about 3.3. .3. It's much easier to interpret this number than it is this one. So when we talk about relative risk, what we're referring to is a comparison, a proportional comparison of the risk instead of this absolute risk difference, which is often very difficult to interpret. Um, that's especially true 
in cases like this where the disease or the sorry the event is pretty rare right if the event is pretty rare you're going to have small probabilities and it becomes that much more difficult to actually interpret what they mean so in this case if we go through and we create a risk ratio p1 hat to p2 hat um, we end up getting, instead of seeing this 0 0.0077, we get 0.55, right? So think for a second. In the context of this problem, if we take P1 hat, oh, it's going to grab me nuts, sorry about the sound equal to a 0.55. What does P1 hat correspond to? Which row in the table? To the top, to aspirin, or more generally to the treatment. Okay, so this is going to be generally true when you're creating this ratio, the probability of the event occurring in the treated group is going to be on top, and the probability of the event occurring in the control group is going to be on the bottom. So again, this is a convention, not necessarily just a rule, but when we're discussing this in class, I need, we need to decide on an approach, and this is the approach that we'll take. Okay, so the probability of the event occurring in the treatment group divided by the probability of the event occurring in the control group. So, what does this 0.55 represent? This gets into proportional reasoning and all that fun stuff that you thought you would escape. What does it tell me about the relative size of probability 1 and probability 2? Probability 2 is bigger. Yes. In fact, this says that Probability 1 is 55% or 0.55 times as large as probability 2. Right? This is, it says, if I um, take probability 2 and I multiply it by 0.55, I will get probability 1 from that. Um, another way to phrase this is what we have up here, is that being in the treatment group reduced the risk by 45%, right? This is saying, so um, P1 hat is 55% of P2 hat. That's also saying that uh, P2 hat Forty-five percent. Sorry, larger. More than P one. Okay. So when we're looking at this, and this is, you have to be wondering why are we spending a lot of time on this? Because very often it becomes easy to do the calculations and find out the relative risk. The interpretation is much more important. So here. So what if this had come out to be, instead of 0.55, this came out to be 1.2? How would I interpret that value? Yeah. Yeah, so if it's larger than 1, that means we are now, the treatment group actually increased the probability of that event occurring. In this case, it's 20% more likely to happen in the treatment group than it is in the control group. Okay, so these ratios are very important, and the interpretation of them, um, while it will take you a little while, you will get used to it, and it's not too difficult to think about. So, something I want to preface. So, when we were looking at differences between 
proportions, like absolute differences between proportions and absolute differences between means um, prior to spring break. When we were, what value did we, when we created confidence intervals, what value did we care about? When we looked at the confidence interval, what value did you look for to see if it was in the confidence interval? Zero, right? Because zero represented equivalence. What number represents equivalence now in like a relative risk? One. Okay, so something that is going to change is when we are doing hypothesis testing and we are creating confidence intervals for relative risk and for odds ratios, we care about whether one is part of that confidence interval, not zero any longer. Not much has changed, it's just that what the notion of equivalence is, is a little bit different. Prior to this, it was what it was saying the difference between the proportions is zero or the difference between the means is zero. Now, because we're taking a ratio, equivalence means one. So we care about whether or not one is part of that interval. Does that make sense? Everybody on board with that? So that's just a pr something to preface. Um, because often this part, I think if we skip over it too quickly, it gets confusing as to how to understand all the conversation that unfolds after this. You say 120% or is it 20%? It's 20%. It's a 20% increase. So when we have a ratio of 1.2, 1.2 means that, um, let's say you're comparing two people's heights. A ratio of 1.2 means that one person's height is 1.2 times as large as the other person's height, which is, is a 20% increase above what that other person's height is, okay? So this is something that actually comes up a lot because um, when we're talking about translating to like percent increase, so if I tell you that um, something had a 120% increase, what is the corresponding ratio? I heard it, it didn't sound certain. It's 2.2, not 1.2. If you have a 120% increase, that means you more than doubled what was previously there. This is a really, this, and this is not something, so if that's confusing to you, don't feel bad, but this, this is a really easy and problematic issue that comes up as we look at percent change and we try to translate that back into a ratio. So when you see that something increased by 200%, people's default behavior is to say, okay, that's a times two multiplier. In fact, it's times three, okay? So this is just something to keep in mind. Um, it won't be too often where we give you the percent increase and ask you to translate it backward, but it does come up often enough in literature where people say, well, this there was a 120% increase in the probability of this event occurring, that means the probability actually more than doubled. Okay. Okay, so as another example, in this one before, this was a nice um, randomized control trial, right, where we assigned people to the aspirin or to the placebo, and then we observed whether the event occurred. Um, what's going on in this situation? How is this similar, how's it, and how is it different from the randomized control trial that we just discussed? That is actually a good point, so we can discuss kind of what we should do, and that might be a fault of me making the tables. <laughs> so it's a cohort, so it's mm -hmm. something that you observe happened after the yeah. exposure of being in the car. Right, right, being in um, an accident, right? Well, clearly this is not going to be a randomized control trial, be unethical. Right? We're not assigning people to seatbelt use or no seatbelt use. Um, so we're doing this retroactively. Right? These reports come from accident reports um, where they have to be able to determine 
whether they wore their seatbelts or not. Okay. Um, just looking at the data, right? It should be clear that what happens with seatbelt use. I'm going to get on my soapbox for a second. I mean, this is not only, if you just look in the fatal column, right, the number of those who are wearing seatbelts is like one third of those that were wearing, um, who were not wearing one. But actually, the total number of people in that seatbelt column is about three, a little more than three times as much as those who didn't have one. Right? right, so we should expect to see um, seatbelts decreasing the risk of this event, in this case, fatal a fatality. Um, so, something to think about. Um, so we look, in this case, we're going to call uh, another way to phrase it as to whether you have the event or not is to say whether you had the disease or not. This is a very common way to say it. It sounds awkward when you're putting it in these contexts. But so typically you can think about this label here always being whether the event occurred <clears throat> or, in other words, whether the disease occurred. Um, it is reasonable to identify the use of seatbelt as the exposure as well. Um, it kind of depends on how you want to do it here. Um, it's not going to fundamentally change how you interpret things because whether or not, right, wh whichever ratio you use, you're going to end up seeing that seatbelt use decreases the probability of a fatality by quite a bit. Okay, just for your own fun, and because we love doing calculations, um, I'd like you to just take a minute and do calculating the risk difference between seatbelt use and no seatbelt use, and then also calculate the risk ratio. And it's possible that I changed a number here somewhere. So if you're getting something different from 0.009 or 10, let me know. I think it's correct, but. And now I have to pull out my cell phone calculator just because it's fun. What did you guys get for risk difference? About 0.009, close-ish. I think if you round, it should end up being 0.009. Um, and the risk ratio should be around 10. wonder if that's a little bit different. What are you guys getting for risk ratio? 
All right, 10 is wrong. I, I changed yeah. something. One of these two, okay, 0 0.009 is pretty close, but it should be less, it should be around 7 something for ratio. Sorry about the adjustment in the table. This is what happens when I think I'm doing something to change the example. Okay, so let's take a look. And I'll do it on here just for ease of having it recorded. Um, let's see if here if I can turn the lights down a little bit. Whoa, all right. Okay, so if we're looking at the calculation, so let's first do the risk difference. So because I'm not going to see, I try to look at this. Okay, so what is the risk? for no seatbelt. How do I calculate that? Uh, I have the number. So what's the pro what do I look at in the table to get to this? Fatal over total for which row? Row 1 or row 2? Row 1. Because this is no seatbelt. Right? So 1601 over 164, 128. Is that right? Risk seatbelt. I hope it is because otherwise I've lost it. Uh, five risk for the seatbelt is five ten divided by four twelve eight seventy eight. Okay, so if we want to just first look at uh, the risk difference, do I want to take? Let's just say risk. Seatbelt minus I mean either way, right? Whichever direction you decide to take it in. Right? It should be depending on which way you decide to calculate this, right? It could be minus point zero zero nine or plus point zero zero nine. Um okay, so Risk ratio. So let's take risk seatbelt divided by risk no seatbelts. Uh, okay, and so we look at risk ratio. Huh, 0.12. Did I do something wrong? No. No, I just happened to flip. The denominator. So if I take one divided by risk ratio, that should get me what I was looking for. Like, either way is fine, but what you have to think about, whichever um, whichever way you produce the fraction, make sure that you think about what's in the numerator and what's represented in the denominator. So if I just look at risk ratio as it is right now, what this tells me is that wearing a seatbelt reduces my risk roughly by about like 87, 88% when it comes to fatality. Again, that's much more difficult to make sense of if you're just looking at the risk difference. Okay. So whatever way you decide to choose, I'm just telling you that the default way that maybe you'll see in text and things like that is to have probability of treatment. Um, probability of control, but it's kind of up to you to decide. If we give you problems and things like that, we'll explicitly state which approach you should take, um, just so we're on the same page. <coughs> Ignore the, I don't quite know how I got the risk ratios, ignore those for a second. Um, 
But in these examples, uh, p1 hat and p2 hat are pretty small, right? The overall risk of them occurring. Um, also, another way you can say that is that they're pretty rare events. So I've already prefaced this a little bit about why we might choose relative risk to risk difference. When the disease or the event is pretty uncommon, relative risk is almost always a better measure. Um, it's very uncommon that I think I even see uh, risk difference used. It's just much easier to interpret uh, relative risk. When the exposure has a small effect, so that means it changes things very little, relative risk is much easier um, to see. So think about situation one. When, disease, when the disease or the event is relatively uncommon, which is what we've seen in our previous examples, but also if the exposure, let's say we're not just looking at seatbelt use versus non-seatbelt use. Let's say we're using seatbelts made in 2015 and 2016 versus seatbelts made in 2013 and 2014. We, they probably have improved, but it's probably by a very small amount. So in that case, we would expect the effect of maybe having the 2015-2016 seatbelts to be larger, but probably not by very much compared to 2013 and 2014. So in that case, relative risk is also really helpful because you can imagine the risk difference is probably also very, very small. Does that make sense? As to, so if you have really uncommon events, relative risk is good, and also if you expect the exposure to have a very small effect on the outcome or the event occurring, um, it's another good time to use relative risk. So, previous slide there, mm -hmm. the right here. You round it to the nearest. Yeah, I probably. And then you did the calculation. Yeah, typically, if you don't have to round, don't do it, um, because when you're dealing with decimals like this, this is why I prefer to be able to like use R in a situation like this, is you can store the variable to a lot of decimal places. So you can imagine, let's say you go through a number of different calculations and you round it a bunch of times. You've lost a lot of precision in your answer after doing that. Um, so typically you want to try and keep it out to a reasonable number of decimal places. But certainly for extraordinarily rare events, it's, you need to keep it out to a lot of decimal places. Okay. So we're going to look at just some defaults, and for those of you who are in EPI, I've been told that this might be a little bit different than you're accustomed to. I'm not certain about that, but this is, when we present more general calculations, um, this is the notation that we'll use. So you're given the 2 by 2 table. Um, A, B, C, and D, those are the variables. So we're saying a represents those who had the exposure and also had the disease or the event happen. Uh, D represents those who were not exposed and did not have the event or disease occur. Um, and so all that we're putting into place here is more formal notation for things that we've already discussed. So P1 hat is going to be the probability of the disease or the event occurring for those who were exposed. And P2 hat is going to be the probability of the event occurring for those who are not exposed. Okay, that's all this slide is saying. Um, it's just that sometimes the default notation can change depending on the field that you're in. So I just want to make sure that you're aware of what we're doing here. The last bullet is a caveat. We're saying this is only valid. So we're saying P1 hat and P2 hat. That's only valid if the exposed and unexposed individuals were a random sample from the population of exposed and unexposed. So what do you, under, when you read that sentence, what do you understand that to mean? Or do you have an example in mind as to something that might violate that example? So our last example mm -hmm. Okay. So... <clears throat> exposed and unexposed. So 
you could consider it to be random in a way because you're looking at there's no you didn't say I'm gonna pick like this many people for whom had like I'm gonna pick 1,000 individuals that did not have the event um, or did not have the exposure and a thousand that did All right we just picked a number of accidents that occurred and then we looked at what happened within those accidents um, but there are going to be situations for those of you who are familiar like when we talk about case control studies where you pick for every you look at the outcome and for every person who had the outcome or had the event happen you pick somebody who's relatively similar that did not have it happen so case control is an example where that's not the those who were exposed and unexposed, uh, they're not a random sample. You're actually explicitly picking them to be in the study. So that violates some of the assumptions. Um, and that actually necessitates this last bullet point here. This necessitates the case where we're going to use odds ratios. Um, odds ratios allow us to do something um, that does not necessarily depend on the random that the exposed and unexposed or a random sample. Um, and it's a little bit trickier. Okay, so we're just going to talk generally. This is stepping back for a second and talking about study design itself because the study design that's used should tip you off to what kind of uh, calculation or representation or comparison of risk you have. So here, we, this was a randomized trial, right? We assigned them to aspirin or placebo. Here we had a cross-sectional study where we fixed the total number of accidents and we're looking at what's happening in those particular accidents. So we didn't go through and select, okay, let's take 1,000 people who were not wearing their seatbelts and 1,000 people who were. Instead, we are taking the total number of accidents and seeing what unfolds from there. So when we're looking at this general structure, and it could, again, it could say disease or event, um, disease and exposure could be any binary variables that you're interested in. So when we're talking about disease and exposure, that makes a lot more sense perhaps in public health or the medical field, where we often are looking at whether disease happened or not, but I'm trying to use get you thinking about event as another way to describe it because that's much more broad. Um, for example, let's say in uh, some of the work that I've done, we do a lot of things called like A-B testing. So we do A-B testing for when people are shopping, they go up to like let's say at Target for example, and they walk up to a display and the display is arranged in a particular way, and they either buy the item or they don't, right? And so what often happens is you change one thing between, let's say, between stores, which is often the case. You control for the qualities of the store, the location, the type of socioeconomic status of the shoppers who are there, and you have these arrangements done differently between the stores. And you treat one as the control, or what you've always done, and one as the exposure, which is the new one. And you look, and so it's binary, right? Either you're part of the control, or you're part of the exposure, which is the new display. And you either buy the item or you don't. Right, so this is a more, in that case, the exposure is which store you're in. There's a control and there's a treatment store. And the event is whether you purchase the item or not. This is how decisions are made in retail. Everything is tested. The layout of a store is a really, um, at least at the larger stores, is a pretty complex um, outcome of a lot of these kind of tests that have been done. So if you ever go to the Target store um, that's on Nicolette Mall, that is one of their primary test stores. So you see that they have uh, cameras that are up on top very often. So this is not, does not apparently does not require IRB approval. Uh, because you're not actually, there's no, nothing about you that's recorded. 
It's only whether you are picking an item or not. Um, there's a lot more advanced stuff that's happening. They'll have people wear um, some weird looking goggles every now and then just to do eye tracking stuff. So they want to know like what are people looking at when they walk up to a shelf. So a lot of um, these research labs are not actually done initially in real stores. They are done, um, they have full on aisles and test arrangements in their, in their offices. Like they have bit inside of the corporate headquarters where they test all of this stuff. So this is an example of, so when you talk about thing, people doing like analytics or data science and things like that, that is an example of the type of stuff that we do. Um, I'm not too interested in the shopping aspect myself. I just walk in and buy the same things every single week. I'm not very interesting. Um, but you can also imagine, why do you think, um, given that you, know, you want to know what the shoppers are doing, why do you think people really have rewards programmed? Like when you sign up and they're like, do you have Target, do you have Cub, do you have any of these things? They don't really care that much about, the discounts are pretty minor costs to them. Um, it's not just to bring in loyalty, it's because it gives them a way to actually more systematically study like purchasing behavior across time. Right, this is the kind of stuff, and this is done, I mean how do you, like on Amazon, um, or Target or any of these things, they build things like called recommender systems, where based on your past behavior and people who are like you, there's different measures for what that means, they recommend things that you should buy. Right? This is the kind of, and this has made trillions of dollars of difference in terms of outcomes, and it's why people who can work with data and do these things are so in demand right now. It's because a lot of uh, companies are going this direction trying to better understand what their customers do. And this is not just true like at Health East. We try to do things like forecast various events happening, probability that someone will return um, within 30 days given that they had a particular surgery or something like that. So this is just an example. This two by two tables, it kind of maybe often is kicked to the curb. It's kind of like, oh, it's not regression and it's not a t-test. But this stuff shows up all the time, and it's a really important thing to know. Um, let's take a uh, like seven or eight minute break, come back, and we'll pick up talking about case control studies. Yeah, what's up? Um, so when you did those calculations up there, mm -hmm. what is the best way to interpret it verbally when you did it, you know, the inverse way and we got the 0.12? Um, I'm just kind of struggling to understand that because in that when case, you did it the other way, we got like 8. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's 8 times as likely. Right. Um, in this case, you're going to say it's 0.12 times as likely. Oh. Right, it's, it's not, the wording doesn't change. It just sounds more awkward. Okay. Like it's difficult when you're t talking in decimals. It's difficult mm -hmm. to say, okay, 0 0.12 means like an eight times decrease. So it's very often helpful to have um, to have the larger number in that right, case. Exactly. So it's kind of up to you. So you can say like I'm mean, one eighth is likely. One eighth is likely. To die right. If I wear a seatbelt. Right. <laughs> yeah. Or like in that case, like an eighty-seven percent decrease. So. It's kind of it's kind of up to you how you want to present it, mm -hmm. um, depending on the scale of the number. So let's say you have a ninety nine percent decrease. Mm -hmm. It's often a lot more impactful to say you're ninety nine times less yeah. likely to die if you. And so that it kind of depends on the context and how you want to present things, because for some situations, saying like oh there was an eight percent decrease doesn't necessarily carry a lot of weight, mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of up to you how you want to report it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just, it's harder for me to grasp the concept yeah. when it's... Yeah, and that's, um, you'll get used to it after a little while, but certainly I think when you're communicating results mm -hmm. to the general audience, it's more clear, like if you have something that's like an eight, eight times more likely, try to phrase it using eight times rather than saying, oh, there's an 87% decrease. Yeah, that's it's it's not as meaningful typically. Yeah.
So, so there's not really, because within the groups, so when you're doing pre-sample p-test, you have two samples and you're comparing like a continuous variable with each one. So there's not necessarily a unless you like a continuous variable and to freeze it into a binary variable. Like, let's say you took people's height, but you decided someone under five inches and so on. To say that like, they don't have the event occur and someone over 65 does, then you can start using this kind of interpretation. So, if you were going to, if you want to use things like uh, risk and risk ratios, you need uh, the continuous variable to categorical. Does that make sense? So, it's, it's nice to be able to do it. A lot of people do it because it's more meaningful very often. But if, unless you have a reason, though, with the continuous one, if, because often the cutoffs can be kind of ambiguous. So why did you choose 65 inches? Why did you choose? So it's a little bit of a, that can be a little bit of an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it will. So when we, so when we <laughs> that do like, things like that, so when you're doing these sample size calculations, <laughs> it's not only important to talk about statistically significant, but also practically significant. So effect size. So what counts as an actual practical significant? That often drives what we think of like how many people to have what we call. Okay. Did you color those or you got them? No, they were clearance. Well, clearance is good. <laughs> They're like the ones that just didn't happen to grab the general public's eye. You have to be willing to demonstrate some of those things. Chris and Dana. So, how many of you have heard the terms case control before? Few? Okay. So, typically, if the disease is pretty rare, and we'll just say the prevalence in the population is less than 1%, it's pretty inefficient to do a cross sectional study, right? Because the number of observations of the event occurring is probably quite low. And what we'll get into as we dig deeper into um, these two by two tables is we'll talk about, okay, how many observations do we need to have in each cell in order to actually carry this out to do these kind of things. So when we have, when it's pretty inefficient, we take a different approach. Um, I think there, if you're interested, there is a clinical, there's two clinical trials courses that are taught here. One is more of a general approach 
and that is uh, 7415. The more in-depth one is 7420. Um, but the 7420 goes into a lot more detail about why like case controls work in the way that they do. Um, it's a pretty remarkable achievement, actually, that we can study things. Like, oh, this is a really nice way to look at very rare events that is still mathematically and statistically viable. There's a lot of underlying theory as to why that works the way it does. Um, but essentially, we can sample a pre-specified number of disease subjects or cases and a pre-specified number of non-disease subjects or controls. Sometimes this can be a one-to-one -one ratio where for every um, case we have one control. It could also be for every case we have two controls or whatever that ratio might be. Well, we won't delve too much into that, but for the example we'll look at, it's very often going to be one-to-one. -one. I just want you to be aware that that ratio is not always one-to-one. -one. Um, controls should be matched to cases on key demographic characteristics other than exposure. Okay, so that's a detailed way of saying, so if you're going to pick a case, there should be a systematic way that you pick controls. So, what might be an example? So, a very rare, what's a very rare event or outcome you can think of? Struck by lightning. <laughs> sure, let's take it. See if it works. Sometimes I don't know where the discussion will go. but um, So, struck by lightning. Okay? So, when we say a pre-specified number of diseased subjects, right? So, in that case, disease would indicate that they were struck by lightning, right? So, you might have a limited population, depending on how much. I think it's amazing there are some people that have been struck by lightning, like, multiple times. Yeah. Just stay inside. You're in a storm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three times. I'm like, someone's got it out for you. Maybe just don't go outdoors when it's lightning. Um, <laughs> Sample a pre-specified number of non-disease subjects. So people who were not struck by lightning. Okay, that's probably not too difficult to find. Um, but the key part, we want to match them on demographic characteristics. So, for example, if you were to take someone who was struck by lightning as a case, what would be a control, a reasonable control subject that you might pick? someone of a similar age, race, and then maybe like a neighbor, you know? Yeah, right? Someone who lives in the same vicinity, um, maybe has a similar health history, things like that, who didn't get struck by lightning. <laughs> um, and for example, or even someone, maybe they were both outside during the storm, Right? These th maybe there aren't too many people. I hope there's not tons of people outside running around. I mean, like, maybe I'll get hit today. Um, <laughs> but that is a way that you could think about matching on demographic characteristics. So we might think, we often think in terms of you know, our public health examples, but this is much more broad than that. So when we're looking, for example, I was mentioning in the testing before about people's shopping behavior, one of the things that we often do is we try to ensure that there are similar, so we think buying a particular item is going to be pretty rare. We might um, try to control for the type of shopper that we're looking at as to whether they buy it or not, right? So that could be matched on things like socioeconomic status, what they've purchased before, Right? Again, this comes back to reward things. They can track everything that you bought before. This allows us to actually do some interesting experiments because you can match people on purchase history, and if their purchase history like wildly diverges at some point, there's probably some event that explains that occurring. Right? Um, this was the back to the... I don't remember which... It might have been Target. It may not have where when they were first getting into doing this predictive stuff and recommender systems, they were trying to predict um, who was pregnant based on purchase <laughs> history. Well, it ended up being that they were 
they were essentially able to, like earlier than the person often knew that they were pregnant, Target was recommending like baby diapers and things like that to them. This is because, so, 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 but, so there was an article. yeah, so, so think about how this works. They have an example, they, they have, a, let's say, a training set of people who are pregnant and not pregnant. And they look at those people's purchase histories. And so they train this prediction, this recommender system on that. And so what they see is there's a, for people who were pregnant, maybe earlier than they even knew, they had some similarity in what they were buying. But they didn't know this yet. And so this is something that <laughs> they had target had to change um, because it was also <laughs> like changing, but it also was affecting people who were not pregnant. Something like, why should I buy baby? Why should I buy diapers? Things like that. Um, but just know that this kind of stuff, um, what we're talking about here, while it's in a public health context, it's broadly applicable to a lot of different situations. And it drives a lot of things that you do. If you use Amazon, if you use any of this stuff, you've encountered situations where you are part of these experiments in some way. When you go on Facebook and you're like, I hate this feature. Have you guys ever logged on to Facebook and saw like some really weird feature that you hadn't seen before, like show up? It'll just be over, and it's a one-off thing. It doesn't show up again later on. That's because you're part of a test, and they're trying to deploy and test whether these features are going to make people engage, or in other words, spend more time on Facebook. So this stuff is all around. Um, it's maybe not just always obvious where exactly it is. Okay, so. Back to the public health context instead of scaring you about recommender systems and things like that. Um, so this is a well-known study, 1950. We have <clears throat> um, 1,357 men hospitalized with lung cancer in London. Lung cancer, so we're going to assume relatively rare occurrence. Um, and 1,357 men hospitalized for other conditions matched to the controls and they're matched on age and hospital. Okay, so we're picking people. Everyone in this study is hospitalized, right? For the cases, they have lung cancer. For the controls, they don't have lung cancer. They have other conditions, but they're matched on age and hospital. Does that make sense as to how they did the matching? <clears throat> so they are looking at whether they were smokers or not. Okay. So, when we look at this example, we want to estimate the probability of a case or lung cancer happening, given that one is a smoker, and we want to estimate the probability of a case or that one has lung cancer, given that they are a non-smoker. The temptation is to just use the same approach we did before, where we look at the cal we pick a row, we do that calculation. Why can we not do that anymore? Or I should say, you could do that calculation, but it would not be correct. Say a little bit more. So when you say from one sample, what do you mean? Um, the previous ones we got time to us from like different like different totals. Like this is like from a thousand three hundred and seven and it's just divided. Right, so we we fixed the number yeah. in each one, right? So remember that statement before where it said I don't know if it said warning or it's only valid if these are a random sample from exposure or not exposure, these are no longer a random sample for exposure and non-exposure, right? Because we have, in the design of the study, we have said we are going to pick this many controls and this many cases. So we no longer have a random sample when it comes to exposure and non-exposure. So, We can estimate some other things.
we can estimate the probability that someone is a smoker given that they have lung cancer. And we can estimate the probability that someone is a smoker given that they're in the control group. Why can we do this, but we could not flip these around and say the probability of a case given a smoker? Okay, it's independent. When we say when you say it's independent, what do you have in mind? Smoker status. Yeah, smoker status because. Um, in this case, our exposure is considered case or control. That is more or less random, right? Whether they ended up being a case or a control is random. And so we can look at the probability that they're a smoker. Okay? But the other way, we can't flip it around because we weren't taking a random sample of smokers before. Right? Smoking was something that we measured after we had already picked who was going to be in the study. So something that is a little bit strange at first is we look at the probability of that one is a smoker given that they have lung cancer. That's quite high. Um, what about the second one? Probability that they're a smoker given they're in the control group means they don't have lung cancer. That's still 0.955, 95.5%. Why do you think it's so high? Are you trying to match, when you, when you match people based on their demographics, mm -hmm. they probably have similar characteristics and more of right. right. You might expect, if you're matching people based on demographics and the fact that all of these people are in the hospital, right? what this might be is that when they're in the hospital, at least at this time in 1950, that's indicative that they're also smokers. right? So there's a, and obviously the smoking rates were very different in 1950 than they are today. So this initial, the <clears throat> thing that can be confusing about this um, specifically is that sometimes people will say, oh, well, the probability that you're a smoker is pretty much the same whether you have lung cancer or if you don't. That's the wrong way to think about this, right? Because we've matched people on demographics. Right? If you just looked at anyone in the population who did not have lung cancer, the probability that they are a smoker is probably not, at that time, 95.5%. But because we've matched them on demographics and that they're in the hospital, that these groups are much more similar to each other. Okay. So... This is where we use, when we're talking about case control studies, we use something called the odds ratio. Um, so sometimes I go down the road of having like a discussion about Vegas and odds, but I think I'll avoid that for uh, right now. Um, so we have Q1 and Q2. Okay. So Q1 is the probability that they are a smoker, given that they're part of the case group. Q2 is the probability that they're a smoker given that they're part of the control group. So when we talk about odds, we're going to say the odds of Q1 is Q1 divided by 1 minus Q1. The odds of Q2 is Q2 divided by 1 minus Q2. So, something to think about before we even get into any of, cal any of these calculations. If Q1 is 0.99, do you expect the odds to be really large, sort of in the middle, or really small? Hmm? Okay, they're going to be very large. That's because the odds of Q1 is going to be 0.99 divided by 0.01. When you divide by a very small number like that, 
It's like multiplying by 100 in this case. So the odds are actually end up being what? 99. Okay. So the odds are 99. 99. Go ahead, write this. 99 to 1. Um, so, <clears throat> some general things to consider. If the probability, um, which could be Q1 or Q2, whichever way you want to look at it, if that probability is greater than 0.5, the odds are going to be greater than 1. Right? Because if we take anything over 0 0.5, like even 0.51, and divided by 0.49, this is going to more than double this number. So, uh, another way, if p is less than 0.5, or the probability is less than 0.5, the odds are going to be less than 1. And if p is just 0.5, the odds are just 1, right? That's equally, so if something is equally likely to happen as to not happen, the odds are just one. If something is really likely to happen, the odds, as we define them here, are going to be very large. If something is really unlikely to happen, the odds will be very small. Okay. So this is how we're going to define them. Sometimes confusion can reign for people who are very familiar with odds when it comes to like betting and things like that. Um, those are often phrased or put in a different, uh, or the notation they use is a little bit different. This is how we'll discuss them here. All right, whole lot of numbers. So <clears throat> what this represents, and again, this is a, more or less nothing more than what we've already discussed. It's just put in different notation. So we're saying the odds ratio of the exposure given the disease. Okay, so that's what that line means. OR is going to re represent odds ratio, exposure given disease. In our case, with uh, lung cancer and smoking, what would E be? What would the exposure be? Oh, I'm just talking about uh, what's the name of it. So exposure would be, is it smoking? So exposure is like right, we're asking about the probability of smoking given the disease, right? Whether they are part of the case or whether they are part of control. So the odds ratio is nothing more than Q1 divided, in this case, the odds of the first one. Right? We've defined the odds of Q1 to be here, the odds of Q2 right here. And so again, we're just taking a ratio of the two. Um, we're doing this, uh, things are a little bit different, right? We're dealing with case control here instead of a uh, randomized uh, control trial. But if we look at what this means, if the odds ratio is greater than one, that means the exposure, which in this case is smoking, is more likely among diseased cases than non-diseased cases. If the odds ratio is equal to one, you're saying the exposure is equally likely among diseased cases and non-diseased cases. And similarly, if the odds ratio is less than one, that means the exposure is less likely among diseased cases as compared to non-diseased controls. So these slides and the ones previous to this are not intended to be a really technical description, but when you're looking back and reviewing these, pay close attention to these interpretations. Like what does it mean when an odds ratio is greater than one? What does it mean when odds ratio is one? What does it mean when the odds ratio is less than one? So, in our calculation, 
we end up getting an odds ratio and just because I want to actually check my calculations because I'm not sure where they may have gone. Let's take odds 1 is going to be 0.995 divided by 1 minus 0.995 that's 2 it's going to be 0.955 So if we look at hmm, okay, well that's interesting. Um, I think I had this right, correct? Okay, so it's around nine point three. I'm not sure if I, I must have rounded before doing. <laughs> this final calculation. But anyway, it's around nine times. What was the, um, when we were looking at our previous situation, okay. So, we're going to talk about math for a little while. I know, don't run away. You're stuck here for a little while still. Um, so, don't worry necessarily about why these things are true. We're just trying to give you an idea of why we can do, or why we can make the statements that we will about odds ratios and relative risks. So, the odds ratios of the exposure given the disease is equal to the odds ratios of the disease given the exposure. Okay, if you go through and actually do the calculations, that's something you can show. Um, what that means here, in our example, we had a ratio of 9.1, which I, if I had kept more decimal precision, would have been about 9.3. So the case control provides, a, provides strong evidence that you're more likely to get lung cancer if you smoke than if you do not. Right? Which, that fits with what we would expect to find. But we had to take a different route to get here because we didn't meet those assumptions originally that allowed us to use relative risk. Right? We, don't, um, we didn't have a random sample of smokers and non-smokers, and so we had to use odds ratios in that case. I apparently decided to use sad faces and I need, to, I, need, I need to update and put like actual emojis and see if they stay in the slides. Um, the odds ratio is a little bit weird to interpret. It's really what this means. The odds of lung cancer are 9.1 times higher among smokers than non-smokers. To me, when you say the odds are higher, that doesn't necessarily give you a lot more information. Um, what I would try to do is Try to not even bring in odds. You can say this provides strong evidence. You're more likely to get lung cancer if you smoke than if you do not. Trying to bring in the actual interpretation of the odds can be a little bit strange. Now, it's not true that the same equivalence, odds ratio of exposure given disease, is equal to odds ratio of disease given exposure. That does not hold true for relative risk. <clears throat> or at least it does not always hold true. So we're sad about that. Now we're going to be happier. Um, this is something that I guarantee will show up on a quiz, probably this, I don't remember which one, but when the disease is rare, okay, this is the exception. So just to keep this in mind, normally if you're using case control, um, if you're using relative risk, Odds ratios and relative risk are not really the same thing. They're, not, they're measuring different things. But if the disease is really rare, which happens very often in case control studies, right? the reason that we use case control studies is often because the prevalence of the disease of the event is very low. The odds ratio of the disease given the exposure 
is pretty close to the relative risk of the exposure given the disease. Okay, this sounds like just a lot of word jumble. We're getting to a point here. What we're trying to say is that when the disease is really rare, the odds ratio that you calculate can be interpreted the same way that the relative risk can. So instead of having to go around and make all of these weird interpretations about the odds, if you get an odds ratio of 9, for example, you can actually, and the disease is pretty rare, you can actually discuss that 9 as if it were a relative risk. That's the idea here. So, but this only happens, again, when the disease is rare. And our measurement for rare is going to be less than 1% prevalence in the population. So, what this means is that because we have this equivalence, that if the disease is rare, we can talk about it as a relative risk, we're going to say, okay, our odds ratio is 9.1 or 9.3. That means smokers are about 9.1 or 9.3 times more likely to get lung cancer than non-smokers. So the reason that we've gone through all of this stuff discussing the equivalence of odds ratios and relative risk is that what we did here is we calculated the odds ratio for case control, but because it was a rare disease or a rare event, we're able to talk about it just like we would a relative risk. So you can say, and so before we caution that odds are a little bit difficult to interpret, well, now we can say, we're going to just use the 9.1 like we did in relative risk. That smokers are 9.1 times as likely to get lung cancer than non-smokers. All right, so this again is going to look like a lot <laughs> of information, but what we're trying to say here is that um, we, can, in all study designs, all of them, we could calculate the odds ratio. Okay. Um, in clinical trials and cross-sectional or cohort studies, which would be like the aspirin or placebo or the seatbelt, non-seatbelt, you could calculate the odds ratios directly. Um, for case control studies, we can proceed um, as we just did to calculate the odds ratios. So, in uh, clinical trials, or case control studies, or sorry, clinical trials and cross-sectional studies, we can estimate the relative risk directly, which is what we did. We estimated the relative risk directly in the aspirin and placebo example and in the seatbelt and non-seatbelt example. You could also, in those cases, have gone through and calculated the odds ratio and then uh, said that it's approximately equal to the relative risk when the disease is rare. For case control studies, that was the point of the example we just went through, is that you can calculate the odds ratio for a pretty rare event. You can actually then interpret it just like a relative risk. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm scared. When you're saying relative risk, do you mean risk difference? Same thing? Or? Uh, no, relative risk. Yeah, so... Relative, so very rarely will we discuss risk difference. It will almost always be in relative risk terms. Okay. Um, from this slide, what this, it's not necessarily important that you memorize everything on this slide, but what's important is that you see that odds ratios don't just happen in case control studies. Odds ratios are always there. We just happen to have to use them in case control studies. But in, it's nice because we can use relative risk for uh, cross-sectional cohort or randomized trials without having to delve into all of this weirdness. But in case control, we have to use the odds ratio. But the nice part is we can more or less discuss it as we do a relative risk because the event or the disease is rare. So... You can probably imagine, up to this point, we have calculated or done calculations of relative risk, right? We've come up with, like, point estimates. But what's always important is that we need to know what the confidence interval is 
surrounding those point estimates. So for example, if I just tell you that the relative risk is 0.55, you might be able to give me a really nice interpretation of what that 0.55 means. But what I did not give you is a confidence interval surrounding that 0.55. So look at this. If I had a, let's say it went from 0 0.50 to 0 0.60, or let's say it went from 0 to 1.1. <coughs> In this case, this confidence interval does not include 1. This confidence interval does. You can think about this in the same way that we thought about the confidence interval including 0. If the confidence interval does not include 1, then you can, make, you can know that if you were to do the actual statistical test, you could identify these as different from each other that the risk in one group is higher or lower than the risk in the other group. But when it includes one, that's the same thing as it including zero when we were doing the two sample t-tests um, or the test of proportion. So again, in this case, we would actually fail to reject that there's a difference in risk between these two. In this case, we conclude that there is a difference in risk. So we will, I promise we will revisit this quite a bit. Um, the confidence interval calculations look a bit different, but what's nice is that you will very rarely be doing any of these calculations. <laughs> you just need to know that like before, when we're generating confidence intervals, we have a point estimate, a degree of confidence, and then an estimate of the error. Those three things always show up when we're talking about confidence intervals. All right, so some things to think about. Uh, why does rel relative risk need to be positive? If you can come up with a case where it's negative, then I will give you an A. Right. Right, it's a proportion, so it's always going to be positive. See, I can make guarantees, like, say, I'll give you an A if you can come up with this example. I, don't, I think that's backfired a few times in mathematics for, you know, really well-known people whose students then come up with some famous theorem and become more famous than they were. Um, but I don't think that'll, you know, depending on how far you go in statistics, maybe you'll prove something that we don't know. Um, a confidence interval based directly on the central limit theorem and normal distribution would not be good here. Why is that? Hint, it's connected to the first bullet point. What does the normal distribution include? It includes negative values, right? We just said that relative risk must be positive. So right away, we're going to have trouble using the distributions that we've used up to this point because both the t-distribution and the normal distribution include positive and negative values. But relative risk can only include positive ones. There's always an initial hypothesis, well, why don't we just chop the normal distribution in half? Doesn't work that way. <laughs> Not that easy. Um, what we'll do is we'll use the central limit theorem based confidence interval on some, a natural log scale and we'll transform it back. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means as we get going. A um, couple of assumptions. The sample sizes are large. Uh, put another way, we're going to say each of the cells should have at least 10 observations in them. Again, that's maybe not everybody's definition of what large means, but we'll say that having at least 10 will be okay for now. All right, just what you wanted to see. Um, this is to just give you an idea of how the confidence interval is actually formed. You don't need to memorize this formula. You don't need to worry about it too much. Um, so 
what's going to be important if, notice that we have ln here, right? ln is natural log. So when you get something, so this confidence interval will give you values. Like the direct calculation will give you A and B. So the, the thing that people often forget to do is that here we transformed into a natural log scale. We need to get out of that natural log scale. What's the inverse of a natural log? E. So even though this process or those calculations gave you this interval, the final interval you want is going to be E to the A, E to the B. And that's because this was calculated under a natural log scale. And we want to undo that operation. The reason that we do this is because we need to be able to deal with a situation in which there are only positive values. This is why we use this natural log. So do that for both endpoints. Um, software will do that automatically for you. I, and I'm going to put a caveat on that, that I need to actually verify that it still does that. Because whenever I say things like that, I realize something has changed in SAS or R. But it should be done automatically for you. So, um, I don't think I want to jump a lot deeper into this today, and this is probably a natural endpoint, given that it's a lot of material. Um, but in terms of what you should be studying from this stuff, go back through and don't don't focus as much on the you know the calculations and things like that. Focus more on how you interpret the relative risk and the odds ratios, um, and what types of study designs you use those in. So when do you use an odds ratio? When do you use a relative risk? And also, when are the relative risk and the odds ratio approximately equal to each other? That's in the case where the disease of the event is pretty rare. Okay. Um, so from this point, um, Julian will pick up here on Wednesday. He was he had a really rough time. I guess he wasn't in Disney. He was in Hawaii for the last like ten days. Um, and then I saw that his flight got canceled. I hope you're listening, Julian. I'm taking out my bitterness. Um, they were they had their flight canceled, so they had to stay more time in Hawaii. So it's very sad. It's a very rough time. Feel bad for him on Wednesday. Tell him that sorry it was so rough. Um, yeah, I'm sure he'll enjoy me having said that. So um, I will put 